Greetings, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our weekly Addis Dialogue. With it, I'm Shifara Olako. My guests today are Lawrence Freeman and Deacon Yusuf Tafari, both advocates for Ethiopia. Raising their voices globally are joining me from the United States of America. You stay with us. Deacon Yusuf and Mr. Freeman, thank you both very much. Thank you for inviting us. My pleasure to be here. Mr. Freeman, let me start with you. Secretary Mike Pompeo, under the Trump administration, tweeted and acknowledged that the TPLF started the war with an assault on the North Command of the National Defense Force and launching missiles into the Eritrean capital. The U.S. knows who started the war. It was the TPLF. So why all the cry out there now? And is there a country that doesn't defend itself when attacked? In fact, from historical perspectives, didn't the U.S. defend itself when the South attacked the North? Yes, the United States has a history. Now, if we go back uh, a little ways to the uh, 1860s, when the United States was attacked by a rebel force on uh, April 12, 1861, by the Confederacy, uh, Lincoln responded immediately by uh, calling up 75,000 Americans to join the armed forces and waged a relentless war over four years, uh, which estimates are may have killed up to 750,000 Americans to make sure that the Union was secure. For him, making sure the United States as a republic, as a union, would not be dismembered and would not be weakened. And for this, he was willing to wage all-out war uh, as long as it took. Now, President, uh, Prime Minister Abi Ahmed was in a situation where uh, a region of the country attacked the military force and the military fort in uh, Mekele, the Great, and therefore had no alternative but to respond. You cannot let a regional or state nullify the nation state of Ethiopia. And the United States and everybody knew this was the case, that they were attacked. And I think the TPLF themselves uh, had a press conference and made some statement admitting this. But the policy of the United States government uh, under the Biden administration has not been to support the prime minister mm. and support the government of Ethiopia, but to actually weaken it by not supporting the government and defending the nation state, the United States is in effect increasing the likelihood of uh, dismemberment and increasing the likelihood that other ethnic militias may join and may continue to attack the government. Already we have now the TPLF has joined with the Aroma Liberation Army and stated openly they want to overthrow the government. The US policy is therefore in effect uh, supporting uh, uh, efforts in uh, Ethiopia by certain forces to uh, weaken the government, if not actually carry out a regime change in Ethiopia. And mm. this would not be the first time that the West has advocated regime change in countries, including in Africa. Now, Deacon, let me come to you. Um, as, as a pioneer in advocacy, uh, the Ethiopian American Civic Council chair how did your organization become involved uh, in Ethiopian advocacy? Uh, in addition, you have launched the very successful Twitter campaign known as Unity for Ethiopia. Now tell me uh, the work you've done so far under both organizational structures. Okay, so Ethiopian American Civic Council was formed uh, actually uh, the day after the massacre of uh, Erecha. Uh, back in five years ago, um, where, it, you know, in some account of over 700 Ethiopians were, were, were massacred. Uh, mm. So we felt compelled that uh, it was uh, our duty and our responsibility to be voice uh, for this kind of human rights violation. Uh, mainly, uh, really, it was an historic time for us to be able to join 
um, the protest against uh, uh, EPDRF, uh, mainly the TPLF. Um, ever since that time, essentially, we advocate uh, many uh, of the concerns uh, Ethiopia as a nation has in the diaspora. Uh, that includes also um, defending Ethiopia's right to develop its natural resources, um, and and having a hegemony on the fact that, that uh, uh, GERD, uh, the uh, the dam, the Renaissance Dam, um, that development uh, should be without coercion or um, Western interference, um, and 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 then uh, it led us into the current crisis, uh, um, which we were all caught by surprise, um, mm. as many Ethiopians are. And uh, because uh, in the diaspora, uh, it took a shape of uh, the fact that, that they were uh, on the same page, uh, the TPLF supporters, that uh, the day after the attack uh, uh, of the Northern Command, they've launched uh, a very powerful uh, Twitter campaign, um, in fact, to, <clears throat> by New York Times and Bloomberg's report, over 3,000 TPLF supporters were being signed in uh, on every single day for almost 30, uh, for a month. And uh, we were caught by surprise, but mm. immediately as we kind of see what was uh, developing, which is essentially um, a very false narrative uh, describing the situation and the misinformations uh, that is being uh, propagated without any, uh, uh, response, we were for Ethiopian American Civic Council, um, we felt that we need to respond and we formed uh, the Unity for Ethiopia platform um, uh, to be to have a global voice for Ethiopian diaspora, uh, which by the way, this last weekend, uh, we celebrated our 50th Twitter platform where uh, so far we have uh, tweeted over 30 million uh, tweets, which we just simply, uh, by God's will, were able to overpower TPLF uh, misinformation. Um, Mr. Freeman, it is clear from most of the international media coverage on the June elections that the process for the most part went peaceful and that it didn't lack the basic prerequisites of a credible election. So that's proof enough, right? That the PM is a legitimate head of government. Then why is America not recognizing this great democratic victory? First thing you have to think about is when you say the United States, there's the United States citizens like myself, there's the United States government, and mm. inside, inside the United States government, there's a, a grouping of, I would call, faction of people who identify themselves as a political uh, economic elite or oligarchy, and they want to mm. maintain superiority on the entire world. They do it under the rubric of, we want to liberal democracy, human rights, and good government. But that's actually just a cover because what they want is they want people in power mm. who are going to be manipulable and malleable to their policies. I was at the election in Ethiopia. I went to the press conference given by the former president of Nigeria, Obasanjo, mm. who headed up the African Union Mission Observing Force, which I think was 50, 60 people. I also went to the East African Standby Force press conference. The Americans were not there. I, mm. I, met, I, I met a person from Washington, which was about, uh, he said there were about six Americans there and they had no chance to really see what was going on in the election. The Europeans pulled out. And Obasanjo, the, the president, said very clearly that there was no intimidation, there was no violence, the polls stayed open, Mm. And people voted, it was peaceful, and it was orderly. And therefore, the rest of the world, and including my country, the United States, we should have said, bravo, congratulations, we appreciate your successful election. And the Ethiopian citizens are really the ones who should be congratulated. Uh, you'll see from pictures, people sat orderly in the sun, they sat 
outside polling booths. They did anything according to a procedure of a fair and honest election. But the West and the United States did not recognize it. Secretary Blinken did not send a statement of congratulations. President Biden did not call President um, Prime Minister Ahmed Abi, Abi Ahmed and say congratulations. And this mm. is the problem, is that uh, similar to not supporting the government in their fight to maintain their nation state, uh, the United States and the Europeans also did not support a valid election. So here you have somebody who's elected to office as prime minister. We have millions of people standing out there. And you have other people in Ethiopia, such as the TPLF and others outside of Ethiopia, saying, well, this, this election is not valid. Well, if it's not valid, then what do you say to the millions and tens of millions of people who voted? Are you just going to say, your vote doesn't count because we don't think the election is valid? And that's, that's the arrogance, and that's also the policy that the West has maintained. Right now, as I say, in effect, Secretary Blinken and other members of the Obama, uh, Biden administration are walking a very thin line because their policies are not directly advocating the government be overthrown, but they are supporting efforts to weaken the government. And therefore, it's a very dangerous course that the United States is on. And it should, I've called for a complete reversal of these policies by President Biden. Uh, I'm an American citizen. I'm now more now born Africa than almost anybody else. And mm -hmm. I'm calling on people to follow my direction and my policy to strengthen Ethiopia because it's a leading nation state. Uh, and economically, it's a leading nation in the Horn of Africa and throughout all of Africa. So if Washington and my president and my Congress and my Senate were intelligent, then they would be giving all our support to the efforts of this government instead of sanctioning the government, withholding $100 million in funds from the government and not supporting the government. These are very serious mistakes which should be reversed immediately. And maybe there'll be some reconsideration of this regime change policy because uh, of the situation in Afghanistan, which was a regime change effort and it failed. And all of the regime change efforts in Iraq and Syria and Libya have failed. So maybe this will be a wake up call for those advocates of this policy that it doesn't work and they'll pull back. But I'm not predicting that, I'm saying that's a possibility. Um, indeed. Uh, yeah, Deacon, would you like to add something here? Yeah, I, I think uh, Mr. Freeman has uh, mentioned that something that's really profound, and, and mm -hmm. that is um, when the United States essentially declare, um, you know, many millions of votes uh, almost invalid because they don't agree with the way the election is done, mm -hmm. uh, then, you know, they don't even prescribe or give you an alternative than how you proceed in handling this. Uh, by the way, I would like to mention in 2015, the, the previous election where TPLF or EPDR declared uh, almost 100% of the seat in parliament, um, mm -hmm. Susan Rice uh, and let, and I'm essentially, and then also uh, President Obama, they both declared that uh, that was a fair election that is 100% democratic, and those are his, their words, okay? And uh, uh, we know what has happened. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, almost not even a year after that so-called 100% democratic uh, election, uh, the entire nation rose up against TPLF and the PDRF. And there is no way you can get almost 100% of the parliament seat and then uh, the day after that, uh, that you have the rebellion from uh, um, uh, from one from one side to the other side of the the entire country, and a nation that accepted that as being a legitimate election. Um, now, uh, fast forward to the present, uh, and seeing a very uh, probably the most democratic election ever in my lifetime. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, history can record this and, and such that uh, 
uh, not even a, a single human uh, 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 human being uh, lost their life in 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 in, in trying to vote uh, their precious vote, uh, and that is unprecedented not only in Ethiopia but uh, also in in Africa. Uh, and the fact that the United States um, has not, uh, just like Mr. Friedman uh, pointed out, and declared that to be a legitimate uh, election and that, that uh, you know, deserve to be recognized by the U.S., um, it is a real disappointment, which shows that how far the United States at this point have gone in, um, in, in, in the direction of trying to undermine demonize, um, even go so far in seeking a uh, regime change in Ethiopia. Um, so I fully concur to what uh, um, Mr. Fir uh, Friedman has uh, uh, expressed. Okay, now, um, as you know, uh, the US government is trying to side with a party, that's uh, the TPLF, which has a dismal history of tribalism. Uh, kleptocracy, if you will, corruption, political persecution, and assassination. Uh, this would have seen, uh, this would have been seen as a cynical move on the part of America if there were any benefits uh, in its choice to side with the TPLF. Uh, and in this case, isn't the USA uh, doing itself a huge disfavor or uh, disservice, uh, Mr. Freeman? If you look at it from the standpoint of what the true interest of the United States as a leading nation and republic in the world, the policy that we have is completely contrary to the actual interest of the United States and contrary to the founding principles of the United mm -hmm. States represented by many of our great presidents. Therefore, the policy is not actually an American policy. It's a policy mm. that, as I said, comes from a political oligarchical faction. They see the world as a fixed game, like a chessboard game you play, and it has fixed boundaries. And there's only so many moves you can make. And from their geopolitical doctrine, which I call a disease of the mind, their doctrine mm. says we have to always maintain uh, superior political and financial control. And we cannot allow nations to move in a direction that is opposite our control or challenges our control. If you look at the history of Africa from millions of years ago to the present, which I have done, I teach courses on it, you can see that Africa is played by the fact that it's not ever been allowed to have strong nation states. If you look at the several hundred years, 400 years of slavery leading to 100 years of colonialism, the nations were never allowed to develop. Ethiopia stands out as a singular accomplishment in defeating the imperialist, at, at that time the Italian imperialist army on the battlefield in Agua in 1896. But every other country in Africa was subject hmm. to colonialism. And those countries are still struggling to relieve themselves from the colonial str strings that are still being placed on them by, let's say, the IMF, the World Bank, and other international organizations. So no country in Africa truly controls its own policy. And that's done by intention. And you mm. see that erupting in, in South Africa today, where the South African economy was never changed. It still is controlled by the major cartels out of the city of London. Politically, there was a change, but it did not correspond to an economic change. And most of the people in South Africa are, are poor. Poverty is increasing. Unemployment is skyrocketing. And there is no solution because they actually don't control their own resources in the ground. So from the standpoint of American policy, I would say this is not American, what we're, we're suggesting what we're doing in Ethiopia. From a standpoint of geopolitics, they don't want to see a strong Ethiopia emerging in Africa. This would set the wrong precedent. Because Ethiopia, with its policy for railroad production, transportation, such as the 
Addis Ababa Djibouti line that, that was established in 2016. The GERD, which would bring energy, energy to Africa. This is the biggest deficit in the world, is the lack of energy among African nations. If you don't provide energy, you're writing off millions of people to die and to suffer. So to oppose energy, which is the policy of the GERD, is to actually oppose development. And these uh, institutions of the West that are not supporting Ethiopia in this time of crisis and not supporting the prime minister are in effect opposing development. They're opposing the elimination of poverty, the elimination mm. of poverty. And therefore, it is not an American policy. Go back to Lincoln's policy. Go back to John Quincy Adams. Go back to Washington himself. Go back to Franklin Roosevelt, John Kennedy more recently. They put forth a completely different American policy that actually represented the interests of America and American citizens, not the interest of an oligarchical faction. I'm left with the responsibility today of continuing to represent an American policy for Africa. And I do it uh, willfully and joyfully because that's what America should be adopting as my policy towards Africa. Just like Mr. Friedman explained, this geopolitical interest and this establishing hegemony is like a political addiction and that they got addicted to that, um, that uh, uh, loyal um, government uh, that they found in Ethiopia and they did not want to touch it. Hmm. But when they found out in, uh, in, uh, in late 2017 and early 2018 that TPLF has really lost the mandate to govern Ethiopia, that there is a, a possibility that the country could go out of control and uh, the regional security interests could be in, 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 in jeopardy. And it was at that moment, they were forced to consider some form of reform to come about. Well, one of the things that they also calculated is uh, even though that it's now the ruling party that is um, is going to be you know, divided into reformists versus hardliners, and uh, here comes Dr. Abi and his administration. United States still believe that they will be just as a yes man, like the TPLF was for the previous 27 years. So. <clears throat> In our understanding, it took them about a year uh, to push and prod, and they found out that, in fact, uh, uh, this administration uh, uh, core belief uh, is directly opposite to what the PLF was, and particularly in bringing together um, the Eritrea and uh, Somalia into the Horn of Africa's fold um, to cooperate, um, to prosper together, to wage peace, um, it is necessarily not done by United States blessings or leadership, but in fact by Ethiopia's initiative and Eritrean initiative has really irked these people. And yeah. their, at that point, their uh, conclusion was that this is not going to be a puppet administration and that uh, uh, what they have been addicted to for the to previous 27 years, they knew that an, a change needed to make. So in 2019, is was the decision that was made uh, in some form, in some shape, to get rid of uh, uh, Dr. Abi's administration. Uh, what culminated, uh, which took about a year and so on, of the attack of November 4, is a continuation of this policy um, of not uh, allowing the status quo, i.e. an independent and nationalistic and in fact, more inclusive uh, regional uh, government in Ethiopia to stay in power. And so we're not surprised that in fact, if you follow this history and really look at, um, but I wanna say in conclusion though, it, you know, it took 15 years for the United States to get back to Ethiopia uh, to, to, to make good uh, back in the 80s. But mm. today, unless they change, uh, you know, their policy, and there are some signs, in fact, 
they are changing their tune. Uh, they want to see a different uh, uh, way approaching and dealing with, with Ethiopia uh, in the very recent days. Uh, they make the mistakes, the errors they've made, are uh, not going to be corrected in 15 years. They may take a, a longer time to correct, and which is not a good thing for either country, and particularly the United States. Um, uh, now, Mr. Freeman, um, Samantha Power uh, uh, comments for most parts of, on the need to negotiate with the terrorist TPLF, but lately uh, she has started criticizing the TPLF for disrupting the process. What do you see there? There's no way that uh, any observer could not recognize what the TPLF has been doing in recent times. I mean, one is uh, immediately after the ceasefire was declared by the government, they launched military campaigns into two neighboring regions, Mara and Afar. Um, they have now joined officially, from what I've read in the press, with the Aroma Liberation Army to join a joint campaign to recruit other militias and to overthrow the government. And they obviously are not facilitating uh, the distribution of food aid uh, in Tigray. So therefore, Samantha Powers, who is now the director of USAID for the uh, Biden administration, she has to recognize some of these realities to maintain any legitimacy. I mean, if you keep saying uh, snow is black over and over again, sooner, sooner or later you lose credibility. Mm -hmm. But I would, I would be very concerned, and I've expressed my concerns to people in the government, uh, of her role in Ethiopia. Because if you go back to the uh, Obama administration, she was the ambassador to the United Nations. And at that time, uh, Susan Rice was in charge of Africa policy. And uh, you had other people in the administration, including Biden himself. And they launched uh, one of the largest, most destructive regime change efforts we've seen, which was the overthrow of President Gaddafi, who was a mixed bag in terms of what his policy was. But he was trying to build a strong Africa in his own way, not that I agree with all of it. Mm -hmm. And when he was overthrown, any observer, such as myself or any intelligent person, could have seen what the consequences would be. And you had uh, all kinds of extremists, including the Tuaregs, streaming out in pickup trucks with uh, ammunition they took from the depots in Libya. And you had an escalation of extremist, violent terrorism across the Sahel, from Burkina Faso all the way to Northeast Nigeria, where they supported and expanded Boko Haram. This, these are the same people. And Samantha Powers was the leader of the uh, regime change against Gaddafi. Therefore, you have to be very concerned, even though she's admitted certain things to maintain some credibility, uh, I do not find her, her ideology is regime change. Or with Tony Blair came, the right to protect, R2P. And this was something he launched, Tony Blair, in 1999. And this was discussed at the UN, it was discussed in the US military, do, should we include in our law hmm. the right for us to militarily intervene in another country if we, the West, the guardians of the world, decide that that country is not treating its people the right way? And in fact, I was discussing with the people that uh, the former Prime Minister Tony Blair wrote an uh, op-ed over the weekend, and he attacked Biden, and he attacked all those who were pulling out of Afghanistan and he said, we still have the right to intervene, to impose our democracies on the world. So he's still maintaining that in 2021. And as I said earlier, uh, the failure uh, in Afghanistan, following the failure in Iraq, both of which Tony Blair was a major player in, uh, the failure in Syria, these things may have a bit of a, uh, a two by four in the head of some people to wake them up that this is over, this is a failed policy. I say may, I think our job is to make sure that happens. We should, we should display prominently 
the failures of regime change and mm. promote policies of supporting nation states and building nation states and aiding nation states economically to provide for the people. I think China's policy in Africa with the Belt and Road is generally correct. And I think there's more than enough need in Africa for energy alone. 1,000 gigawatts of energy is needed in Africa. 50,000 kilometers of railroad is needed in Africa. The United States could be investing as a friend and making money at the same time and building up these countries. We don't do it. Why? Why don't we do it? Why don't we support development? Why haven't we issued a statement from Lincoln and Biden? Um, your organization did an effective uh, work by being the first advocacy uh, organization in the diaspora to pass HR 128 uh, against the TPLA while they were still in power. How did you manage to succeed in this endeavor? And what do you think are the implications for today and for the future? That's, that's really a good question, uh, I mean, essentially, um, I think you can attribute uh, a couple of things. One was uh, the gross violation, human rights violation perpetrated by TPLF. Mm -hmm. um, it has gotten to a point that they, they uh, can no more hide the fact, um, and it, it is beyond their ability to control. I, this, I'm talking about the United States government or to apologize uh, on behalf of TPLF anymore. I could tell you a story of what happened uh, as we navigated through Congress for the passing of HR 128. What really happened is that now we went to, from subcommittee to committee, from committee to the full floor, but how, along the way, there were many, many obstacles and resistance for the passage of such um, an African nation um, legislation. Um, it's they're not. In fact, uh, probably it's one of the first one to ever pass in the way, and then it became consequential resolution as it uh, um, as it uh, uh, coincided with the rebellious uh, situation in Ethiopia. Now, so mm. what happened was they resisted. They fought us tooth and nail. Uh, mm. TPLF hired a very powerful lobbying firm to a tune of one and a half million dollars to fight us. Um, and the government even, uh, TPLF, uh, uh, warned uh, the, the House uh, of Congress that if this resolution was to pass, that any security co cooperation that Ethiopia was doing with the United States could be in question. And they warned them not to proceed with it. So they, they, they held and I went to Congress uh, twice to give testimony. Uh, we passed uh, the committee's levels and what, what not early on in April 2017. And here we were because there's all these obstacles that we faced uh, in late October. Um, they were still holding it. They froze the, the resolution not to, to, to go forward. But something developed, something happened in Ethiopia that we gave them uh, something that they are worried about, which is basically the security situation in the country. And we basically said that the country is outside of the control of the federal government at that time. Well, they went mm -hmm. back and, and got some intelligence report and they said, well, CIA believes that uh, the, the, the Ethiopian government at that time, the EPDRF, is still strong and they can deploy security forces anywhere they need in any part of the country. And we think that they still um, can hold, the, hold it together. And not shortly after they said that, a month later, we got a, a, a call from Congress, uh, the people who championed this uh, resolution, and they said, well, there is a new development. And uh, they said uh, CIA has uh, reversed their position that, in fact, that they have now concluded that uh, um, the EPDRF cannot control the country. And there is a security um, concern that for the first time in 27 years that the United States has. And at that point is when they gave us the green light to proceed with HR 128. And then in early 2018, uh, by April, um, that we uh, secured a unanimous vote to pass the, the resolution.
What is so key here to remember is that if the United States government at that time did not believe that their interest, that mm. what they speak out of Ethiopia was not at risk, the human right violation by itself would not have done the job. So uh, there are a culminating event and there was a wide uh, broad uh, support from the Ethiopian diaspora that we were able to gather um, and, 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 uh, and truly in essence, uh, it was time uh, God has heard the cry of Ethiopia. Um, you know, the, 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 the resolution passed on April 10, 2018 almost the same week as uh, uh, Prime Minister Abiy was uh, uh, pronounced uh, uh, as a leader of the country. And all of this created a perfect storm, so to speak, uh, to, for to have this historic uh, resolution. By the way, Atusha Barra, we had um, about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, mm. we had a face-to-face -face meeting with Congresswoman Karen Bass. Mm. And the with the question I asked her at that meeting was as follows. She was the one who authored the mm. HR 128 four years earlier. And so essentially, she's basically the one who documented all the crimes that TPLF has done, uh, you know, to, to elevate it to the point of having to pass a legislative document uh, accusing them of gross human rights violations. So I asked her, I said, were you wrong about this four years ago when you actually documented the crimes against hum humanity uh, perpetrated by TPLF? Or do you really believe in three years these, this, this, this organization has elevated itself uh, from being the worst uh, human rights violator, violators to mm -hmm. becoming a, a noble rebel as uh, worthy of uh, United States support? Um, and she actually was caught by surprise. And she said, uh, uh, she thanked me and said that she would go back and read uh, the provisions that was contained in HR 128 uh, before uh, uh, advancing the current uh, uh, resolution they are working on, which is HR 445. Uh, the use of child soldiers was covered by several credible media outlets. Um, and why do you think, uh, Mr. Freeman, the humanitarian organizations and the U.S. media, as well as policymakers, uh, would ignore this violation of U.N. policies against uh, child soldiers. Again, you have to go back to what is the underlying motivation for the lack of support for the government of Ethiopia, headed by uh, Prime Minister uh, Abiy Ahmed. The use of child soldiers is outlawed, actually, in the, uh, the United Nations itself. I believe mm -hmm. it's one, uh, one of the crimes that's listed by the United Nations. The problem you have is even the United Nations is not totally free from political influence and political pressure. And many of the uh, human rights groups and NGOs that uh, profess great concern for the conditions of uh, women and children in the developing sector and in Africa in particular, they have a very skewed conception of human rights because they believe that the human rights of people end uh, when they are born. But in fact, with the human right to have a productive life, hmm. the human right to have electricity in your house, to have a house, to have enough rooms in your house so that your children can study in leisure and attend school, the right to have a job, a productive job, a meaningful job, so that you bring home a paycheck and you can cover the cost of raising your family. These human rights are ignored all the time. And even when such a uh, an obvious condition of a child using child soldiers is brought to the world's attention, these become ignored because many of these groups fall into the same general mentality that we have. They try to paint African leaders as uh, dictators who mm. ignore the rights of the people. And in the case of the Prime Minister uh, Abiy, 
they're attempting to use any propaganda they can, such as, for example, shortly after the attack on the uh, Ethiopian National Defense Forces, the main line that came out of the media and the U.S. government, Tony Blinken, for example, Secretary of State, was genocide. There's genocide going on in Tigray. There's ethnic cleansing going on in Tigray. The Ethiopian government is using food as a weapon in Tigray. The Ethiopian government is using rape as a weapon in Tigray. Now, once you hear those catchphrases, which I've heard my whole life in Africa, I spent a lot of time in Sudan, defending Sudan against charges of genocide, which were never proven. They never, there was no genocide, it was a very ugly war. But these charges are used to mobilize the passions of ignorant people who are, who are swayed by public opinion and outrage. And of course, you may know that there was recently a leaked discussion of, by the United Nations, the people in the United Nations in Washington and New York and people on the ground in Ethiopia, that mm. in fact, it did not have data, evidence of rape being used as a weapon. There obviously is rape, but that's not a different question. There's no evidence, only allegations of ethnic cleansing. But these words and these phrases which are repeated by CNN and the Daily Telegraph and the Guardian and the New York Times and even Al Jazeera. They're repeated so often that people think they're true when there's no proof that has yet been given. And this is uh, how policy gets shaped. And this is the same with our congressmen. I mean, congressman Bass pays attention to Africa. Most congressmen have no knowledge of anything going on in Africa they'll read the same media reports that the citizens of the country will read, and they will be fooled by the same false propaganda that the citizens will be fooled by, and they go along. So, you, so when something comes along like child soldiers, they have to basically ignore it because it's too obvious evidence to prove that their underlying theory about the TPLF is incorrect. The fact that so quickly after the counterattack by Prime Minister Abiy on the attack in Mecca. Yeah. So quickly after that occurred, that all these charges came out, immediately tipped me off that this was an operation against the state, nation state of Ethiopia, and against the government of Prime Minister Abiy. And in fact, I've been recently thinking that the whole movement in Tigray the, yeah. the separation, the cross, the separation of autonomy and the military attack may have been a planned operation to drag Ethiopia down when it's making progress in a successful election, when it's making progress in the GERD, when it's making progress in developing light manufacturing industry, that this may have been a planned setup to drag the government into the situation that would weaken them and pervert them from the otherwise positive direction that you're taking. Um, indeed. Now, um, uh, you recall that uh, international media outlets were pushing the federal government to provide unfettered access in the state of Tigray previously. But now, uh, few international media outlets uh, seem to be interested to see the situation in the regions of uh, Afar and Amhara. Uh, what do you make out of that? The reports that were coming, like what Mr. Friedman was saying, almost days, days after uh, the Northern Command was attacked, was this were a prepared statement and accusation. In one sense, they say um, the Ethiopian government would not allow, give us uh, unfettered access to, uh, to go to uh, Tigray to, to investigate human rights violations. But at the same breath, Immediately after that, they will say there is a, 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 a whole litany of crimes that is being committed in, in Tigray. Well, if they didn't get any access, if they didn't have the that unfettered access they were demanding, mm. where are they getting the report the fact that such crime, in fact, took place? And, and so the, the entire bias, and, and it was pre-planned, premeditated, a plan to demonize Ethiopia and to really put uh, their thumbs on the scale so that it favors TPLF 
has made them even contradict their, their claim. Uh, now, uh, as you correctly pointed out, that there are clear indications of child soldiering, full report, um, even when they, the, the very um, children that are, you know, uh, were captured, gave live um, uh, interviews, how they were abducted on the streets, uh, forcefully uh, conscripted into the, into the, into the army, and uh, were, didn't have proper training, didn't even have uh, shoes uh, uh, when they sent them to the war front. And uh, by sheer luck that they were captured alive, uh, they said uh, these are children that were told by the government to, to, to give that false testimony. And so you, they don't even have to go to, 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 to see it uh, uh, as they earlier demanded. Even when the evidence itself was brought to them, they refused to accept that because it would not fit into the narrative that they want to, uh, uh, to convey to the world. Um, so um, the crimes that was committed, in fact, if we're talking about human rights violation in this whole nine months time, uh, mm -hmm. it was committed by TPL and my cadre, and not even a single uh, news source or government agency, or for that matter, human rights organizations such as Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch or others have made any credible assessment of the human rights violation that was done by TPLF. The same thing is happening in Af Afar as well. Mm. So you see, uh, you wonder how all this is possible. How is it government, the, the administration itself, the U.S. Congress, the legislative body of the U.S. government, then further go to the entire media system, then you go to the intellectual circle and think tanks, then you go to uh, human rights uh, institution, global institutions, then you go to uh, international finance systems. How is it all of these are working in concept almost seamlessly and once they make their decision to do damage on a state nation like Ethiopia, that, 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 that nothing you can say, nothing you could do, uh, that they would be willing to con consider. But like uh, Mr. Friedman said, this is not the first time they have done this. They have they've become so good at it. They have perfected it every time. They've done this on Libya. They've done this on Iraq. And now they just did it uh, um, to, to, to Afghanistan. It, it, it is highly orchestrated, highly synchronized, and th that it is takes a tremendous amount of time and effort to actually crack through their narrative to tell the truth to the world. How do you determine these human rights in the middle of a war? A war is a violation of human rights itself. It's the only time that we give human beings a legal right to kill other human beings. Human beings are the most precious thing that's been created. And yet we give armies the right to kill other people under war conditions. And the war has to be just to do that. And under conditions of this kind of conflict in Tigray, it's the war itself is a human rights abuse and it has to be ended either militarily or otherwise as soon as possible but you cannot expect that conditions will be normal when you have people killing each other and this should never have happened if there was more strength for the ethiopian nation state this war possibly could have been avoided and we have to avoid future conflicts not only in ethiopia but in other countries as well and therefore there has to be a complete revamping of u.s and western policy with away from this idea of geopolitics to a possibility of development. I'm working with a group of Africans, the United States and Africa, to develop something akin to the Marshall Plan to, to set up an infrastructure development bank, which would lend credit for infrastructure, credit only. And that would be key in the areas of energy, rail development, road development, hospitals, schools, etc. These are the fundamental blocks that nations need to uplift their citizens. 
And I believe that we can, with the right policy from the West, we can eradicate poverty, we can eradicate hunger. But we have to give up this geopolitical doctrine and we have to give up the use of manipulation of regions and ethnicities who are manipulated from the outside to mm -hmm. cause these crises. I think that the situation in Tigray was manipulated in advance to cause the most uh, discomfort and dislocation and disruption of the policies of Prime Minister Abbey. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Freeman and Dick and Yusuf. Thank you so much for your wonderful perspectives. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, dear viewers, with that, we come to the end of this program. Many thanks for watching us. And until I see you next time, it's goodbye from Mishu Paralako. Stay safe and take care.